It's time for another Written on the Pitch with Jessica Charman. Jess, how are you? Doing great. Looking forward to MLS opening weekend, Jason. It's a busy weekend of soccer coming up. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit extra buzz in the air with the openers tonight in the league, Atlanta United tomorrow in Orlando. We're going to talk about that, but we've got a little CONCACAF business to cover first. Atlanta United advances to the quarterfinals of the CONCACAF Champions League. 2-0 on aggregate, a pair of 1-0 wins. It's felt like every 45 minutes has had some different component to it. But where do you feel like this team is after a couple of competitive matches? You know what? They did a job. We talked about that in the first leg as well. And I just feel like there were things to work on. It's work in progress. It's the first couple of matches under a new coach. You've got new players coming in, but they did a job. They dealt with it professionally. They kept another clean sheet, which is huge for a defense with a young goalkeeper in net, two clean sheets. And you've just got to be happy with the result and the advancement. And of course, as we expect, things to work on, work in progress, but overall satisfied with coming out with the result. Yeah, you use a, a term that I don't think we generally use a lot with American teams, you know, doing a job. It's a very common expression when you're talking about a, a two-legged tie in these kinds of situations where, hey, it might not be the prettiest. You had the 1-0 mm-hmm. lead going into the second game. You didn't have to be pretty. You just had to survive in advance. And maybe there was a little bit of disappointment with the the way Atlanta did it from some fans. But ultimately, you're trying to get to the quarterfinals, and you did. Exactly. You have a game plan going in, and the most important part of that game plan is not to concede. If you go into it and you draw nil-nil, you still go through. It's one of those where, okay, it wasn't the prettiest match. It definitely wasn't the most enjoyable to watch, but they knew what they were doing. And it, it was pretty cool to to grab a goal at the end to seal things up. The 2-0 aggregate maybe flatters Atlanta United a little bit, but I never thought, I never felt like they weren't going to come out with the result. There were a couple of moments where uh, we saw one Big save from what I remember, one big uh, leg save. Other than that, not really tested too much on frame, but a couple of opportunities where it did look like we were going to be exploited behind the back, but pace and defense seemed to to help us out. Yeah, let's get into that one difficult play for Rocco Rios Novo. It, it, I don't even think it was necessarily a shot. I, I think it was a, a through ball that was, was getting through. Um, I can't remember the defender. I think it was Anton Walks who took a bad angle. He couldn't get there sliding in front, trying to get in, in front, deflect the pass before it gets to the attacker. The attacker doesn't get a touch either. How difficult is that for a goalkeeper where you've got not just one person that could redirect it, but two within, what, 10, 12 yards? It's all about patience and it's all about not cheating. As goalkeepers, we talk about cheating and trying to guess. And sometimes you have to do that on a penalty. Goalkeepers guess. You know, the speed of play that you have, you can't react from 12 yards most of the time. But the majority of goalkeeping has to all be about reactions and waiting as long as you can to make the movement. And what he did really well was stood his ground. He didn't guess that there was going to be a deflection. He didn't cheat and move in one direction. He just stood up big and, you know, made the save. My concern would be as a goalkeeper, though, how on earth did a ball make its way through that far without one of my defenders getting onto it? And the more I think back to it, and it's been a while, it wasn't the most powerful delivery into the box. It was one of those slow rollers that as a goalkeeper, you're almost like having to play chicken with yourself because it's taking so long to get to you that you almost are overthinking it. Yeah, I was really impressed that it didn't even look like it phased Rios Novo. You know, he didn't... You you see sometimes in that situation, because you're trying to cover all the angles, you you see the goalkeeper, you know, maybe like kind of shuffle their feet side to side, like just trying to make sure that they're ready for anything. He seemed, you know, cool as a cucumber. He was set confidently in that position. And to me, what that shows is that he's very confident with his positioning and net. He didn't doubt that he had his angles right for everything. He didn't doubt that he had, you know, the ability to move across the goal. And maybe that's one of the things that I noticed about him in his 
young age and his positioning, he is very quick across the goal. And that's something that allows him to hold for longer because he has the confidence that he can cover back and front post with his speed and movement across the net. What are are some of the things you're starting to see that kind of mark the way you would describe Gabriel Heinze's Atlanta United? I think the biggest one is that you do have that big gap between... I'm always thinking of things from a goalkeeper's perspective. And I think the biggest thing is how it's going to change the role of the keeper. And we've talked about it a lot on the podcast before. And you can see that it is going to call upon whoever's playing in goal to step outside their comfort zone and play higher than they might be used to. Um, That doesn't suit all goalkeepers. And it's something that can cause a, a lot of nerves for a lot of goalkeepers because it does mean that if you get something wrong, you are out of position. And it's very important not to get caught in no man's land. And then the other thing you notice is the confidence. And it is something that I would say we've done in previous seasons is building out through the back and playing possession. But I feel like more than ever, the goalkeeper is becoming that extra 11th field player and having to be used to the ball at the feet. And I thought Rocco Rios Novas did a really good job of being cool, calm and collected 90% of the time, I remember one or two dodgy kicks, but that's always going to happen when you work out how often he is in possession with the ball at his feet. And that distribution is going to be key when we most likely see Guzan back in frame tomorrow. Yeah, his passing was really important. And in a game where Atlanta had, pulling it up now... 67% possession. Yeah, 67%. (laughs) There you go. You're on it. Um, Rocco's numbers specifically, 34 of 42 passing for a goalkeeper. 8 of 16 on long passes, too. And that's 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 a lot of touches for a goalkeeper anyway. 42 passes, 45 touches for a goalkeeper. And when you think he only had one save that we remember, it shows how much he was involved with the ball at his feet. And that, I would say that favors a young goalkeeper, though. I've talked about it previously, that the hardest part of being a goalkeeper is if you're not involved in the game very often, because you have to stay mentally focused and switched in, even though you're not getting those touches. So for a young goalkeeper that might have a few nerves, even though he didn't really display that, getting those early touches with the ball at his feet keeps him alert, involved in the game, communicating with his defensive line. And what I loved was he clearly has a presence in the dressing room because you saw how his team reacted around him after the game and with the satisfaction of the clean sheet and when he made those saves. And that's so helpful for a goalkeeper because if you have those relationships, it's easier to hold your defenders accountable and to expect them you know, to take care of you and do their part as well. Yeah, it's been really impressive for Rocco Rios Novo so far. Brad Gazan will be back in goal on the weekend against Orlando, and and we'll see how he handles you know these situations because he only got about forty three, forty four minutes of time <laughs> in that first leg. Um, he's going to be really... and he has some bad memories of playing in that. You know, like we yeah. look back at his red card, and again, I don't blame Guzan for the no, red card, I don't but it was a stitch up of a pass. Right. But those are passes that he may get more often because that's the risk that you have when your midfielders want to play it back to the goalkeeper and they want to restart all the time. If they do not hit and wait that pass perfectly, then you start to wonder if you're going to stitch up your goalkeeper more often. Right. And you get a little hesitant if you're the goalkeeper in that situation and it can really start to trickle down. You just have to play through it. That's something that Gabriel Heinze has talked about. You have to make mistakes right now to learn, and that's what he wants all these games. He, he's, I'm sure he's thrilled as much about going to the quarterfinals in CONCACAF Champions League. Minutes. Two more games. Yeah, 180 more minutes. It's, it's more time to learn, more time to get better. What he said this week in, in his post-game media availability that stuck with me was he was asked about you know how well the, the defense did in, in getting another clean sheet. And, and he said, you know, excuse me, I disagree. It, the work is collective. You don't mm-hmm. have to think about the defense, the middle, or the forwards. You have to think about all the lines of the team that support like the that. defense. This team defends from the front, and it's maybe more defending up high than we've seen from a team in Atlanta so far. Yeah, and it's one of those where, look, as a, as a goalkeeper, I've always used the cliche, it has to get past all 11 people before, mm-hmm. you know, all 11 people on the pitch. It's not my fault I let in a goal. Well, how can we as a defensive line take claim for a clean sheet 
if I'm using that phrase when there's a mistake. So right. I like that from a coach because he's explaining just collective responsibility. And if it applies to clean sheets, it also applies to wins, to losses, to draws. And it's that accumulative uh, sense of responsibility that should help this team. And you're right, Jason, when you look at the matches and you look at the role that the forward line have in pressing and in starting defense we always talk about uh attack starting from defense and build up but on the flip side as you say the defending starts from the attackers and they have a role and it's conditioning is going to be key because it is exhausting to play that way yeah it's an organized way of playing up high as well it's not you know a, a press where it just feels chaotic of just chase 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 mm -hmm. no they're they're structured to where you're trying to to funnel the other team and, and where you're trying to make their possession end up. You're, it, it's all about structure and having some freedom within the structure for players to show their personality. And that balance can be, I think, difficult at first. And we've seen a little bit of it. We saw it in the first half uh, on Tuesday where you had the 1-0 lead. Maybe there was a little bit of, of tentativeness from Atlanta United in terms of committing numbers forward playing their game. I thought the second half looked like we saw the first half in Costa Rica, but you mm -hmm. got to go through these experiences collectively to, to, I think, imprint this way of playing on your, your DNA. Definitely. And that's why the minutes are key. And actually you look back at the first leg and you know what? I don't think they'll have minded going down to 10 players because it's another one of those scenarios that you don't necessarily get much practice off until it happens. So it is good to get these learning moments of, okay, if we go down a man, how are we going to respond? How are we going to change how we play? So these different moments in CONCACAF have that advantage when it comes to MLS season as well. Yeah, it's huge. Um, I go to a quote, too, that Gaston Jimenez of Chicago Fire, who played for Gabriel Heinze at Vela Sarsfield, he was asked about Heinze this week during all the, the MLS media days. And, and he said, Heinze changed the way I see and live football. I had two and a half years of pure learning. He lives football with a lot of passion and he transmits it to you. That's been echoed by the players so far when they talk about intensity. I think everybody zeroed in on like, oh, the training sessions are really hard. They're running a lot. They're doing a lot. I think a lot of it is the intensity of learning. They're having mm -hmm. to think and absorb so much information all in a short period of time that it, at times it can be a little bit of an overload and maybe you get a 45 like we saw on Tuesday, the first 45 anyway. Yeah, because a lot of players aren't used to that style of coaching. You know, a lot of players are probably used to coaches that want to move the puzzle pieces around, but aren't necessarily trying to change the shape of your individual puzzle. Whereas I think in this team, we're going to see a lot of players that are having to learn and adapt and potentially play a different way than they're used to playing. And what's interesting about Atlanta United is with the age range in players, you've got some players, you know, Lissandra Lopez is what, 38, right? 37, 38. Yep. Someone like him that's been around the game for so long now may have to learn a new way. And that's really interesting to see the difference in how this coaching style suits veterans versus you know, younger players coming out of the twos. And I think it's going to be exciting to see. But at the end of the day, no player is the finished product. And it can be exciting to learn. And as long as you have that open mindedness and willing to learn, I think that this could be a really exciting season of development. But it's not going to be the finished product. And if you've got players saying that you've got two whole years of learning, it, it's never going to be the finished product. It's always going to be work in progress. It just, we as fans obviously want to see progress but we're going to have to be patient yeah I'll, I'll i'll continue on the analogy that that you started with i, I think what we're going to see here is not one puzzle being created from the puzzle pieces i think the puzzle will take on a lot of different shapes and pictures because you want a team that can do different things with the same 11 on the field you mm -hmm. want teams that can look different in the way that they approach it. Versatility, I think multifunctional, I think guys who can end up in different positions, like your, your left back playing a central midfielder, stuff like that. And that is not easy to do in two months and two games. No, and that's why 
as you said, and I think it's going to ring true, the more matches these players can get under their belts, as much as maybe you worry a little bit about conditioning and overwork and workload, these players just want to play and they've got coaches that want to see and work what they what they are practicing on the pitch because one thing that is so true is no matter how many 11 v 11 scrimmages you do in, in practice or in training, it can never recreate you know, the intensity or the realness of competitive minutes. Yeah, it's just impossible to do. And now you've got more competitive minutes coming on Sunday with Atlanta heading down to Orlando. MLS opener, you know, Atlanta does have two games under their belt and Orlando doesn't. Orlando's got some questions. Uh, Nani has been limited in preseason, although he's not listed on the injury report that we've seen so far. They do have a couple of injuries in the back, though, with Robin Janssen listed as questionable and Joao Moutinho, their left back, listed as questionable. When you're at these, put yourself in Orlando's shoes right now, and I, I know that might be a little difficult, maybe a little hey, painful. I'm gonna, you know what's interesting? I had an Orlando shirt when I was in college because it was the closest MLS team. It was. So, it was. I, it's somewhere in my basement, probably, but and alas. Probably <laughs> keep it there. That, that, that's fine. <laughs> Just pretend it's hanging around right now. And if you are. Orlando preparing for your first competitive game and two of your four members of the back line are questionable, even if they do play, they're, they're not a hundred percent. Does that worry you a little bit against this oh, Atlanta United 100%. side? I think it worries you regardless of who's playing and that's not to disregard Atlanta United, but anytime you're not sure if your starting back line is going to be available, you're going to be concerned because out of the players that you need the most consistency of, it's always got to be your goalkeeper and your, your your defensive line because those are the ones that really require the most consistency, the most communication, the most understanding of each other. So the minute you switch out different pieces of that, it can cause issues. It can cause, you know, uh, nervousness, uh, lack of communication. So I think you're worried regardless. And what Orlando does have in their favor, though, is they have scouting reports now they have 180 minutes of soccer that they've been able to watch about land united so at least they have a little bit of you know uh, idea of what they might expect what are your keys for atlanta united going down to orlando to get a result tomorrow i think they need to be more clinical i mentioned that after the first game we don't know how many chances that atlanta united's going to get so you you need to bury those chances i also think that Again, with this gap behind the back, we need to make sure we close the gaps between midfield and defence sometimes. And we need to make sure that our goalkeeper and our defensive line communicate well so that they do know, you know, who's coming for what and they don't get caught in no man's land. And the last thing is no silly mistakes. You know, I think that's and it's a lot easier to make mistakes early on in the season, but it's so important to go out to this one and not have any individual errors if you make mistakes as a team or you concede a goal yes but you don't want to give away anything cheap because the minute you're going down to Orlando and it's we know how we can call it a derby that sort of uh, animosity is Mm -hmm. it's one of those where you don't want to let Orlando into the game because you're playing away from home and you don't want to allow them that player advantage from the crowd by giving them hope in that match yeah it can snowball a little bit when you have a, a cheap mistake you know, and, and that's the balance here for Atlanta early on is you're going to play on the edge and you're going to play to a point that it's it's not easy to make mistakes, but it, you're 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 making you're you're putting yourself you're taking in, risks. You're yeah. putting yourself in the position that you can make those errors because it's fine margins. The way you're playing, yep. the difference between, you know, the weight of a pass, it's such fine margins that something can be very slightly different, but it can be costly. Yeah, you're not going to be making simple plays. You're going to be making more challenging plays to hopefully create better opportunities going forward. At least that's the idea. So mistakes will happen, and you can't be afraid of making them because I think if you do, maybe you get a repeat of the first 45 from Alawalenze and Kennesaw where it was a little too tentative yeah you've got a risk but you don't want to give away anything easy that's the balance you're trying to deal with right now it's not easy it's it's tough now i'm glad i'm not on that pitch because we're making it sound real difficult today yeah it's just it's a different mindset you know and i think that's something that we'll see evolve over these early games of where atlanta united players get comfortable 
with that balancing act of not wanting to make a, a silly mistake and give something to the other team as a gift, but also being willing to put yourself in situations where you might make mistakes. A hundred percent. And it's just going to take time. And I'm excited to see tomorrow. I don't know a hundred percent what to expect, but I think everyone's just glad to have MLS action back. I'm glad to have the rivalry with Orlando back because these are the games that are really fun where it's it's two teams that don't like each other. You know, I mm-hmm. mean, I think it's the perfect start for the Atlanta United season because it's not just any game. It's a game you're going to be up for no matter what. Mm-hmm. And it's one of those where usually with openers, yes, you want to start your season strong, but the games, if you lose you know you've got a whole season to recover. Yeah. But with this one, losing has that extra element of disappointment. So we know for sure, and I'm sure there's some fans traveling down there as well, that none of them are going to want to come back empty-handed. Yeah, 100%. We've also got to get into, in this last week, the U.S. women's national team has had a couple of matches. Not a great one against Sweden, a better one against France. I know you had a chance to watch the Sweden game in detail. What did you take away from it? I mean, it's one of those that we've talked about time and time again that with friendlies and different matches up for the U.S. women's national team, sometimes when you play against teams that haven't got the same caliber of player yet or are still in their developmental stages, you don't get the same tests. And what I loved about this week's actions was it was two teams in both matches that were actually going to pose more of a threat and a competitive nature for the U.S. women's national team. And, you know, Sweden, I thought, really took the game to the U.S. women's national team. They came with a plan, and we know that Sweden has caused problems for the U.S. in the past, and they did so. I think that the U.S. got back into it. You know, they had Rapino with the pen at the end, but it was one of those where I think it created a lot of questions for the team, and then they responded. I believe you watched the second one. I didn't have an opportunity to that, but from what I've read, they responded to those questions with some better answers against France? Yeah, a little bit. Um, It wasn't 100% France squad. They've had some COVID issues and didn't have some of their top players here. But what stood out to me from that second game, it's really been an ongoing talking point for the U.S. women's national team, is who is going to play the number nine Mm -hmm. And, you know, you've had so far in 2021, you've had Carly Lloyd, you've had Katerina Macario, and now Alex Morgan is back. And and I thought Alex Morgan really put her stamp on the position in that match. And it reminded me a lot of her work in 2019, where Alex is a player that, yeah, you can get distracted by the celebrity a little bit with her, Mm -hmm. but she is a very physical player very hardworking, very selfless player because she's turned into a a target forward that's maybe one of the best in that kind of role in the world. I mean, she took a beating in the 2019 World Cup, but Mm -hmm. facilitated the play so much. Well, I'll speak from experience. I mean, Morgan had a baby fairly, fairly recently, and I'm, you know, back playing Sunday League now, but the difference in recovering from having a kid is absolutely astounding so you've got to be patient with her but it seemed like from what you're saying that she's back to her old self back to that physical nature that can be tough to find back to that physical strength and she she, I think you describe it really well with the celebrity of Alex Morgan and I've been guilty of it too sometimes when someone has such a reputation you can maybe be a little bit of a harsher critic because of the way that they're portrayed in the media and because of this stardom. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she went over to England and she didn't play very much. And there were lots of pictures of her on the bench in her, in her bench coat, looking unhappy. And there are a lot of people writing her off. And I think she's come back and she's shown them that, no, you you know, I've come back from big things and I'm, you know, ready to return to who I was and how I can play and actually become a better, more effective player than before. And if you rile up Alex Morgan, then whoever plays against her, I don't envy them. Yeah, I I think Morgan is the player for the Olympics. Um, And this is a tough decision because of the size of the Olympic rosters. You only get Mm -hmm. 18 players to take. So small. (laughs) You'd love to give Carly Lloyd this opportunity because it it will be her last Olympics. Um, You'd love to give her this opportunity, but I don't know if you can actually afford to take her to the Olympics. No, I think it's one of those where 
these players have legacies, right? And you want to treat them with the respect they de- deserve. But is it a disrespect to bring her just kind of because? If that makes sense, she yeah. wouldn't want to go if she's not the best pick. That's a disrespect. Right. And you might think that you're honoring her legacy and giving her one last hurrah, but that's not how you show respect to a player of her caliber. How you show her respect is playing her where you need her. And if she's not in that small squad, she doesn't make that final, you know, that last cut, then that's how you respect her. And you're right. I think she she was good against Sweden, but she wasn't as effective as a, a Morgan per se. And I think yeah. that you have to take your best squad, even if you have to make some difficult decisions and leave players behind. Yeah, that that's what it comes down to for me is Morgan's better for the team. And the the way she plays the number nine is a better fit for this team. So I also think Carly Lloyd kind of made it clear with her comments after 2019 that she doesn't really want to go just to make up the numbers. She doesn't want to mm-hmm. go and, and be on the bench. She she thought she should have played more in 2019. So I kind of take that as she's not happy being in a backup role. And, no. you know, with Macario, she can play wide. She can play in the midfield. She can give you some versatility that, that I just don't think Carly Lloyd has at this point. And Lloyd, you don't look at Carly Lloyd and see an abundance of different places that mm-hmm. you can play her. If you have an injury and you haven't got many subs left, she's not going to be able to slot into different spots and be effective. You're going to have to move players around her to fit her back up where she is most comfortable and you can't do that in tournament play no. because for all you know, particularly with an 18 player roster, next thing you know, you lose a couple of players and you need people that can fit in multiple positions when you don't have the same size squads to select from. I think it comes down to Alex Morgan and Carly Lloyd. And, and I think you have to take Alex Morgan in, in this situation. Uh, there will be a few more opportunities uh, before that final roster is delivered. Uh, that's, I don't think Vlatko Andonovsky is completely done with the decision-making process. But right now, I think from what we saw, it's going to have to be Alex Morgan over Carly Lloyd. And it has nothing to do with Carly Lloyd's legacy or, or career. It's not a, you know, a, a mark against it in any way. It's just what happens at this point in your career. There's just better players for the team. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing is, a player with her maturity, she knows that. And and like you say, if she says she doesn't want to be a a bench piece, then she wouldn't want to be in that position anyway. So uh, I think that it's just the way the cookie crumbles kind of thing. And Morgan, we can say our praises. She came back strong and she deserved that spot most likely. All right, Atlanta, Orlando tomorrow. Uh, NWSL's back underway as well. We'll be digging into that a little bit deeper on, on upcoming Written on the Pitch episodes. Uh, also, if you follow the women's game in Europe, the Spanish League is now available on Ada Football, and that's available on the Fanatis app, uh, fntz.co slash soccer down here. Barcelona is an amazing team to watch in the women's game. Highly recommended if you get a chance to, to tune in for those games. But we'll get into all of that next week, Jess. Um, Atlanta will have a, a league match under their belt. We'll break that down and dig into uh, other topics from the listeners out there. Looking forward to it, Jason. Well, uh, Jess, we were just actually signing off, and Atlanta United has announced that Rocco Rios Novo will be signed to a short-term agreement for the Orlando match. Um, Extreme hardship situation, so let's try to explain this a little bit. Um, In the extreme hardship situation, and that's the only way you can sign him for an MLS match, for Open Cup, for friendlies, if you're playing an international friendly, for CONCACAF Champions League, you can sign players who are on your USL affiliate to short-term agreements. You're limited to four per season. Well, now you've used two already. This is number three. For an MLS match, it's a much higher bar. You can do this. Field players, It's almost it almost never happens. Uh, the team has to have fewer than 16 outfield players available. But in goalkeeping situations, 
fewer than two goalkeepers available. Alec Can has not been ready to participate again since his offseason shoulder surgery. Ben Lungard has a lower body injury, and he is unable to go for this. He was on the bench on Tuesday. He's unable to go. Rocco Rios Novo will be on the bench, we expect, uh, to face Orlando against with Brad Gazan back in net. Yeah, it's what a what a trip this has been for that young man. I don't think he'd have ever imagined that he would have been signed to his third short term contract. And it's one of those where, look, you gotta you gotta do what you gotta do. It's a little concerning for Atlanta United because they've used up so many so early on. But what's confidence for the team is that they have a player that knows what he's doing, that's shown he can play with these players and he's earned it. And I think it's exciting for the twos as well. If you flip it that way, you've got a goalkeeper now that's got some first team experience and has done very well. Yeah. I mean, if you drop him into the twos opener next weekend, he's going to be coming from two games in CONCACAF being, you know, on the bench for an MLS match, hopefully just on the bench. We don't want to see Rocco <laughs> tomorrow. No offense, Rocco, but we want to get Brad Kazan some games here, but then he's going to go into the twos and he's going to become even at his age, a, a leader with that group. These are of the what things, shown. these experiences age you as a goalkeeper. Yep. It's one of those where you cannot recreate minutes like this. So it's so exciting for him. And the twos have always had decent goalkeepers, but now they have someone that is growing in confidence, believes in himself and knows that this club trusts him. So really exciting times, a little concerning for Lungard. Sorry for him and a back yeah. injury as a goalkeeper, a real concern. So we'll wish our best to both Lungard and Khan and hope they have speedy recoveries so we don't have to sign any more short-term contracts. Yeah, it's it's a tough spot. And I know people will ask, well, like, what else could they have done? He's on loan from Lanus, and we don't know what the, the purchase situation would be there. There's rumors about a, a 2 to $3 million purchase agreement in the loan, which is not a bad deal at all, but if you are already, you know, up against the cap, for example, you can't just do it now and bring him to your first team. And then also, you know, Alec Cannon and Ben Lungard, you got to figure out what to do with them when they're healthy. You're not going to carry four goalkeepers. So there's that issue. There's nobody else with the twos that you could assign to a short term agreement because the only other goalkeeper that has factored in in, in preseason so far is Vicente Reyes, who we've both seen in, in action. In He's USL. even younger. He's younger, and he's not on a pro deal. He's only on an academy deal right now. If he signed a pro deal, he would give up his college eligibility, which might not be the path for him, but he might not be ready to make that decision yet. So it's really, there's no other solution here at the moment. And it's just a really bizarre situation, but Rocco Rios Novo will be with the team in Orlando um, on another short-term agreement, and he's getting a lot of experience really quick. Hey, goalkeeper life, Jason. Goalkeeper union. You got to be ready at any point. And we're ready just in case news breaks again. But we're actually going to try to end the show this time. And we'll be back next week. We'll break down Orlando. We'll break down anything else that happens uh, around MLS this week, around NWSL, and more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.